Well, this is a presentation of just the PowerPoint portion for lab two. In this lab, we're going to be covering some chemistry, mitosis, membrane transport, uh, tonicity, microscopy. We've got a lot of things to cover today. Uh, we're going to start, though, by looking at pages 72 and 73 in your big Amerman book. And if you look at the very top of that, uh, this is about how molecules move. And we're going to be setting up an experiment here that deals with petri dishes and dyes. But what I really want you to imagine is that you are on a magic school bus ride and you are imagining how is it that molecules are able to move in your body from one cell to the next cell. And that's really what I want you to be able to think about, although we can't demonstrate that in the laboratory. So at the very top, it says part one on page 72, and we're not even going to do that. What that uh, asks you to do is to take two beakers of water. One beaker is full of warm water. One beaker has cold water in it. Into each of those beakers, you're going to drop one drop of some food coloring. Now, we already know what's going to happen. In which of those two beakers, warm or cold, is the dye going to diffuse or spread more quickly? Warm, right? Because we know that temperature affects how fast molecules can move. So we're not even going to waste the water and the beakers to do that. You know that temperature affects how quickly things can move. What I want to focus on, however, is part two, down below or lower on page 72. Now, part two uh, gives you like six little steps to do. And what you're going to be doing is you're going to each group of two individuals. So uh, each group of four, table of four, will have two groups in it. And you can jump in back there and be a group of three between the three of you for this demonstration. And you're going to grab this Petri dish. This Petri dish has been filled with auger. Auger is a seaweed extract. And into it has been four equally uh, little wells have been bored out of this. And you're going to follow the directions. Three places in the room, we've got <laughs> setups on blue trays where you'll find a stack of these plates. You'll find some dyes, and each one is labeled uh, with its contents. And the instructions basically say, fill the well. One drop, right? Don't try to fill the well. One drop will be fine. So one drop of dye into each of the four wells. We have some Sharpie markers up here. So we want you to label your plate. Make sure you're labeling your plate one, two, three, four on the bottom. You put it on the top, they spin, right? So don't, don't label things on the top of a plate. Always do it on the bottom where it won't move. The, these dyes could be, they're not, they're not going to be toxic, but they could stain your clothing, and they could certainly stain uh, your skin. And I've seen plates kind of get kicked across the room and splatter dye onto people. So for that reason, uh, we will be wearing gloves. Now. The person who's actually putting the dyes into the plate is the one who needs to be wearing the gloves. If you're the other partner right now, you don't have to worry about gloves. You will, however, be wearing gloves later in the lab when we do the pH and the acids and bases and the solubility things. So for now, just the people who are actually putting the dyes in need to be wearing gloves. I like to see everyone wearing goggles when you're around that, just while you're loading, just because you know things happen. We always want to plan. We don't want to plan on emergencies or accidents, but we want to be precautious of them and avoid those things. And we normally would have white coats for you, but apparently we put out five boxes of coats last night in the hallway, and only one was there this morning. So somebody found them and decided that they were a really cool thing. I don't know why. So we ran short on them. So we're just going to be using another group's lap. You're just going to be putting it on to keep it safe, OK? And uh, we've got some over here. And we'll put them back in this bin. So rather than going out the hallway and grabbing them, Mark has had you start distributing these dyes amongst yourself. And you'll put them back, or put, uh, sorry, these coats. Uh, and then we'll put them back. And then the next time we need coats, which will be for the fetal pig dissections, we'll have coats for you. Um, so don't put your names on these, right? They'll already have a name from somebody else from the earlier lab. Once you get your coat, go ahead and uh, get your goggles and, and gloves who are doing it. Go to one of the three stations, each side of the room and in the front, and go ahead and set this up. Once every group has their four dyes in the wells, uh, it'll probably take us about six minutes to get that done. And then we'll all count that as time zero. So we'll all kind of start the clock at the same time. It'll be off by a little bit, and that's OK. And every 10 minutes or so, we'll stop and discuss what's going on. And while this is about as exciting as watching paint dry, there are some very important concepts that we'll be demonstrating during this. So let's go ahead and get that going, and I'll start the lecture up after we have those going. So 
you've got your four dyes in the plate, and while that's incubating, don't worry about measuring anything right now. We'll stop at about 10 minutes, uh, and we'll do that as a group, okay? So turn in your PowerPoint notes, please, for lab two, to this slide right after the beginning. And like I told you earlier, yes, we're playing with Petri dishes and dyes, but what I really want you to be able to imagine is that you have trillions and trillions of cells, and every one of your cells has to get nutrients, has to get oxygen, has to get rid of CO2 and other waste products. And so there's this constant movement of molecules in and out of your cells, and that has to move through what's called the cell membrane or the plasma membrane. I know that you're talking about chapter three a little bit, cells. So you know that every one of your trillions of cells has a plasma membrane. And that plasma membrane acts as both a barrier and a gateway, right? It, it keeps things out, but it also is allowing certain molecules into each and every one of your cells. The membrane is said to be selectively and semi-permeable. What does the word, well, let's start with permeable. Permeable means what? Something can pass through it, right? Now, what about selectively permeable? What does that suggest about how molecules can move into or out of the cell? Only certain molecules, Only certain molecules right, are allowed. So there's a selection process. A uh, college that is more selective only lets certain students in. We understand this word. What about semi-permeable? Semi-permeable. How does that change that meaning a little bit? What does that suggest? Not as picky, not as selective, right? We've lost our selection, but and but... It's kind of like a thinner, more trans... Yeah, you're, you're on the right track. What it tells us is that certain molecules can move into and out of our membranes without selection, and this is usually very small molecules like water or like oxygen, O2. Very small molecules have pretty much free reign moving in and out of the cells without a selective process involved. And I always think of semi-permeability as being like our southern borders, right? We've got people coming and going. We don't know what's happening on our southern borders. It would be described as being semi-permeable. Now, you know from your pre-lab that there are two basic ways uh, by which molecules get in and out of the cells. I shouldn't call them ways, but instead categories. And this would be passive and active transport. What did you learn? What is active transport? Let's start there. Active transport, if something moves across a membrane via active transport, what was involved? Energy. energy. Energy, right? And in biological systems, that energy is almost always ATP. So there's going to be ATP or energy involved in the process of moving the molecule into or out of the cell. Now, we will not be demonstrating any active transport mechanisms today. Everything we'll be talking about today will be passive. That is, it does not require energy, right? So the passive mechanisms that we'll discuss are all without the requirement of ATP or energy. Let's start with the first one. This is a passive type of transport, and it's filtration. We know what filtering is, right? Uh, if you had coffee this morning, there was maybe a, a fil coffee filter involved. If you had a tea, there was a tea bag involved. Um, if you've been to the beach with kids and filtered out sand and water looking for something, shells, you know that that's filtration. There's no energy involved. There's no ATP involved. In your body, you have a filter called the kidneys. And we know that the kidneys filter your blood. And what they basically do is allow very small molecules to pass through. No energy going on. And those small molecules can end up as part of our urine. In this picture, what we have now is, is a capillary, a blood vessel, from the kidney, and it shows that there are these small openings. So little molecules can get through, they become part of our urine, larger molecules cannot get through, and so they are kept back within the blood vessel. So we have a biological filter in the kidney. For now, don't worry about, in fact, not at all this semester, don't worry about this hydrostatic pressure deal. I won't worry about any of those ideas. Just know that there is no energy, uh, but there is obviously a membrane involved, right? There's a, there's a filter, there's a membrane involved when you're discussing filtration. Now, the, the next type of passive transport, and this is what you're doing right now in your plates, is simple diffusion. Simple diffusion is, is defined as when a particle 
a molecule goes from an area of higher concentration and spontaneously, right, without energy, travels to a place where there's less concentration or less of that molecule. And I can demonstrate that by opening up a bottle of cologne or if I just pretend that this red Sharpie is a bottle of cologne and as I open up this bottle or this cap, right, these molecules are highly concentrated inside and as soon as I open it, molecules will start drifting from an area of higher concentration to an area of lower concentration in the back of the room. We get it, right? I'm not here just to insult you. These are concepts we know about, but we haven't necessarily thought about them in light of cells, which is, again, where I want you to start thinking about. Now, we would say that the difference in the concentration in point A, that is the more concentrated, and the place in the back of the room or wherever this molecule is going, point B, that there is a concentration gradient. Fill those words in. Concentration gradient is what's formed between the point A and the points B, and molecules will always move in the direction going from high to low concentration. So this picture uh, basically demonstrates what you're doing right now. This petri dish is filled with a fluid, and in the center of this has been put a, a dye crystal, and uh, this molecule is diffusing, it is breaking down, and it's spreading from the central area where it's in higher concentration, and it is moving out to where it is in lesser concentration. So we're going to say that this molecule, and this is the terminology I want you to use, this molecule is going down its gradient. Okay, It's going from an area of higher concentration to an area of lesser concentration. I think of it as... If I have a rock at the top of a hill, it will kind of go down, right, down the gradient, down the slope, without any energy being put into the system. However, if a molecule is going to go from an area of lesser concentration and move in the opposite direction, so if, if all of a sudden I saw molecules moving this way, right, from an area of lesser concentration to an area of higher concentration, we would say that the molecule is moving up its gradient, and if you're pushing a rock up a hill, you better believe there's energy involved, right? So if you see something going up its gradient, it's going where it is becoming more concentrated, and that is not going to be spontaneous. It would require cellular energy. I think of this like my kids' rooms, right? It seems like with no energy at all, spontaneously, their rooms become a mess. But it takes an awful lot of energy to put things back into order. So maybe your bedroom, you know, is like that sometimes as well. Here's what we're going to do. It's, it's 10 minutes close enough for what we're doing. We're going to say that at the 10 of, we started. Now on page 73 of your Amerman book, you're going to record the distance that the dye has diffused. You have little rulers at your table. And we want you to use metric, so use millimeter or centimeter marks, not the inches. And you can either lay the ruler underneath the plate or carefully put it over the plate without getting it uh, messed up with dyes. And I don't care if you measure the radius or the uh, diameter, just be consistent in all of your measurements. And then you'll measure, you'll record this in the 10 minute place on page 73. Okay, so make sure you record this. Now there's one thing about page 73, ladies and gentlemen, that I don't like. And that is that the author did not put a zero minutes column or row on that table. So if you would please add a zero minutes all the way across for all four dies. And let's go ahead and by convention say right now that at zero minutes there was zero diffusion. So put zero minutes and zero time across that chart. You will be graphing this data and turning it in next week with lab number three. And I want to make sure you have those zero time, zero uh, distance points on your graph. Another way of thinking about diffusion is demonstrated in this beaker picture on the screen. Now, again, this is showing a beaker with a green membrane going down the center. But I want you to instead imagine that this is a cell and molecules are moving in and out of the cell. It says that it's a permeable membrane, which means that the molecules can go on both sides. At the beginning, at time zero, 
Everything on the right side is, is water. The little blue spheres represent water molecules, so it's 100% pure water. And over on A, there's some other molecule that's dissolved in there. That could be a sugar, a protein, a salt, but there's something else over on that right side, or sorry, left side. And we know what's going to happen. Over time, at some point, we're going to come to a place where everything is equal, right? On the left and the right, everything is equal, and we would say that we have reached a what? An equilibrium, right? We've reached an equilibrium. Everything, both molecules are in equal concentrations on both sides. That could take seconds, minutes, hours, who knows, but at some point we get to that point. But let me ask you, are there still molecules going back and forth when we reach equilibrium? Yes, right? There's still, your cells are still receiving molecules back and forth, but there's no effective difference in the concentration on either side. Now, to make this equilibrium happen, what had to happen? We had to have water molecules go from where, where they were in higher concentration to where they were in less concentration. And we also had to have the red molecules that were in higher concentration on A side go over to B side. So again, this idea of diffusion, molecules moving from an area of higher concentration to an area of lower concentration. And the really cool thing is that different molecules aren't affected by other molecules. So it's all about, you know, the water is water, the red molecules are red molecules, and they don't interfere with each other's movement when it comes to diffusion. So we, we're, we're, we've talked about at least one thing, two things, so far that affect the rate of diffusion. I'm actually going to start on the bottom of this chart because I think this is probably the most basic of all. Membrane permeability. If I have a brick wall in between the cells, nothing's going to move and it doesn't really matter. So the, the first thing I want to think about is, is the membrane permeable? Does it allow for the movement of the molecules in the first place? And if it does, then we can take a look at the, higher, the four higher things and ask or, or, or describe that temperature can affect the rate of diffusion. We didn't even do that experiment, right? We said that if you put food coloring in a hot beaker and, a, and, a, and then a cold beaker, we know that the, the dye would move more quickly in the warmer water. We know that. We didn't even do it. We already know that temperature affects this. In what we are doing, we're not demonstrating temperature, but what if we had taken one of these plates and put it on a heating pad and taken one of these plates and put it in the fridge? Right? In which of those two setups would you expect the dyes to move more quickly? Heating pad, right? No surprise. So again, we know temperature affects it. It's why Coopersville stinks a little bit more in the summertime, on a hot day, than it does in the wintertime with those, that, that uh, landfill odor traveling through the air. Number two, molecular weight. How big is the molecule? Bigger molecules can't move as fast. Small molecules can move quickly or more quickly through or across a membrane. So we recognize that size of the molecule has a difference in diffusion rate. Number three, how steep is the concentration gradient, the CG? How steep is the concentration gradient? I can demonstrate that again. We'll go back to two Sharpie markers. And we'll imagine that these are two bottles of cologne. The red one is the cheap knockoff stuff, uh, watered down stuff from Walmart. And the green one is the good concentrated stuff from the boutique counter at Macy's. And I open up both of these, and which of these two colognes, red, the cheap stuff, or the green, the good stuff, is gonna reach the back of the room more quickly? The good stuff, right? It's more concentrated. So more concentrated <coughs> molecules will move more quickly across a membrane or will diffuse more quickly. Finally, the surface area. If you ever, well, put in a, an air filter in your car or change your heating filter in your furnace, you know that filters um, are pleated, right? They have lots and lots of surface area, and that pleating of the filter is going to increase the life of that filter. It's also pretty obvious if you go to the beach to, to uh, filter out seashells at the beach, the bigger the filter you have, the more that you can filter. So the bigger the surface area, um, we'll see faster diffusion. Now, we are not demonstrating surface area today, right? Because everybody's got the same plate, the auger is the same. We're not demonstrating that today, but it could be a factor. And, um, but we are demonstrating molecular weight and concentration gradient. So I think it's about that time. Go ahead right now and 
take your 20 minute reading and record those numbers on page 73. Okay, does everyone have some numbers? Record those numbers. What are we discovering so far? Which of the four has diffused the greatest distance? Number one. Probably. And which one has diffused the, the, the le least distance? Number three. Number three. Other folks? Number four. Let's talk about one versus four right now. Why is it that well one has diffused the greatest, and why has well four moved the least? Look back at the descriptions of what you've put into those wells. In the instructions, it tells you what those are. The for, for like four. it absolutely is. So look at one versus four. One is potassium permanganate. It's that purple dye. And it says it has a molecular weight of like 158 or so. And then if you look at well four, Congo red, it has a much larger molecular weight, 900 and something. So based upon that, right, it's making sense. One is going to move more quickly because it's smaller. Four is going to be more retarded because it is larger. Fair enough, understanding that's molecular weight effect. Yeah. Now let's take a look at wells two versus three. You may not see a difference yet, but of those two wells, two or three, which one would you anticipate over the next 30 minutes winning the race? Which one is going to diffuse further? Two versus three. I heard a two. Any other thoughts? The only other choice would be three, right? Two or three. Why are we saying two or why are we saying three? They're both the same dye. They're both the same dye. They're both methylene blue. They're both the same molecular weight. That's not changing. What is different is that well 2 says 0.1 molar, and well 3 says 1.0 molar. Molar, molarity, is a measure of concentration. So well 3 is 10 times more concentrated than the dye in well 2. Now understanding what the molarity means, which well 2 or 3 do you anticipate moving further over the next half hour? 3. Now why? It's more concentrated, right? So concentration affects, right? The steepness of the concentra concentration gradient affects how quickly the diffusion will occur. So it's 10 times more concentrated. It's the good perfume, right? It's the good perfume from Macy's versus the cheap stuff. So it's going to move more quickly because it's more concentrated, OK? So in this plate, we are demonstrating molecular weight, and we're demonstrating concentration differences. We are not demonstrating uh, so we're not demonstrating um, size of membrane, surface area, and we're not demonstrating temperature, but we could. Right? We could have done something with that. Now, let's talk about another type of diffusion, and this is a special type cause called osmosis. Osmosis is simply the diffusion of water. And I am rather confident that somewhere in middle school, and then again in high school, you were forced to memorize the definition of osmosis. The movement of water across a semi-permeable membrane. Right? Does that sound like a mantra you've heard before? So what is that semi-permeable membrane? The cell membrane, right? So osmosis is the movement of water, and what we really care about is how water moves across or into or out of a cell membrane. Now when you think about osmosis, you're going to forget about everything else and focus only on the movement of water. And we're going to imagine that the movement of all other molecules is restricted. So just kind of freeze frame and think about just the movement of water. A couple of definitions to make sure you're OK. And that is solute and solvent. You know that our cells are aqueous, watery, and that most everything in our cells is uh, dissolved or uh, found in water. Water, therefore, is the solvent. Everything is, quote, dissolved in the solvent. Everything that's dissolved in, our, in the water, proteins, sugars, all those molecules, salts, uh, everything that's dissolved, we could call solutes. Right? So the solutes are dissolved in the solvent to make a solution. 
when Jennifer made up these dye bottles, she took water, solvent, she added some crystals, solid crystals of dye, and then they dissolved or dissociated and created a solution of dye. So not to make this difficult, if I told you that I have a solution that is composed of 10% protein, right? If it's 10% protein, I'm telling you that it's essentially what percent water? 90. 90, right? Don't make this hard. And then if I tell you that my solution is 85% water, then it suggests that it is made up of 15% protein. Now, it wouldn't have to be protein. It could be salts or sugars or some other solute. And again, in osmosis, we're going to be asking ourselves, which way will the water move? And you'll always get it right. Always, always, always get it right. If you remember this phrase, solutes suck. Water will always be drawn toward solutes, okay? Or solutes will suck the water toward it. So let's take a look at this and uh, figure this out. And then after I do this slide, we'll take our 30-minute measurement. Here, again, I want you to imagine not a beaker with a membrane, but instead a cell. And here, the membrane is only semi-permeable, so like a cell membrane. So this is a semi-permeable membrane. And at time zero, at the start, water is fully 100% water over on the B side. And on the A side, we've got water plus some other solute, sugar, protein, salt, something that's over on that side. And look what's going to happen. The red molecule cannot get to the other side. It is restricted. The membrane does not allow the movement. Remember, this is a semi-permeable membrane, and bigger molecules can't get across. And so only the water can move. So the water goes over, and actually there is a volume change. There will actually be a volume change from one side of the membrane to the other side because the solutes are sucking the water toward them, and there, cannot become, there can't be the equilibrium with the red molecule because the membrane can't pass that big molecule. This is the basis of why people get swelling, edema, right? Water goes where it shouldn't normally go, and as a result, they have an area of edema or swelling, and there's lots of reasons why that can occur, but just think about water is where it shouldn't be, right? Water's not in the right place, and a lot of it has to do with solutes, being, uh, water being sucked over to excess solutes. Okay, let's take now our 30-minute measurement and think about what we've been saying as far as what affects diffusion and ask yourself, are you seeing the expected results? So you've got your 30-minute numbers recorded. And now let's think about, I told you that solutes suck. Let's think about this movement of water. And there's another term, another concept that I'm going to throw at you called tonicity. And tonicity basically is defined as the ability of a solution to affect the volume or pressure, in this case, of a cell. So in this drawing, this little orange hexagon represents a cell. And this cell is in an environment that is surrounded by water, if you will, just like a cell, or surrounded by all of its environment. This cell, we're going to say, has within it uh, 10 percent solute, just for teaching. So it's got 10 percent solute inside the cell. What does that suggest to us? That there's also what inside the cell? 90 percent water, right? And we're going to put this cell into a 100 percent water environment. Another way of thinking about it, 0 percent solute. Okay, so no solutes in the environment. What's going to happen here? Water's going to go which way? Water's going to be drawn into the cell, isn't it? Solutes suck. There are more solutes in the cell than outside of the cell. And as a result, this cell is going to, it's going to swell. It could even become so overwhelmed it would burst. And the word we're going to use for that is it will lice. So the cell could actually take on water so quickly that it would lice, break open, be destroyed. Now, in this environment, we're going to use the term hypotonic. This environment has less tonicity. It is hypertonic, hypo, let me make sure I said that right. It's hypotonic compared to the environment. Okay? Now, the way you can think about this is that in a hypotonic environment, the cell becomes hippo, 
hypo, hippo, right? So in a hypotonic environment, the cell is going to swell and take on fluid and perhaps even burst. That's hypotonic. This is a red blood cell that has taken on some fluid. You don't yet quite know what a red blood cell should look like. So we'll kind of pass over that. We'll come back to this. But I assure you this red blood cell looks very swollen. And I know that your PowerPoint slides, this looks like a big black blob, and it doesn't help you very much. Now let's compare this with another environment. It's the same cell. So this is our same, this is our same uh, cell. It has within it the same 10% solute. But we're now going to put it into an environment that has 20% solute. OK. So what's going to happen now to this cell? It's going to shrink, right? Water is going to, water, solutes suck. So solutes are greater outside. Water would come out of the cell. As a result, we're going to say that the cell is going to shrink. And the other word we're going to use for that is that the cell is going to crenate or result in crenation. And what you're going to see now is that the cell is going to have this blotchy kind of star-shaped appearance to it because it's going to shrink down. We're going to say that this is a hypertonic environment. There's more stuff, right? More tonicity out in the environment. And as a result, solutes suck and water was drawn out. Now, another way of thinking about it, and you'll still get the right answer, is that inside the cell, there was 90% water, right? And eight, outside the cell, there was 80% water. So which way is water going to go? Water is going to go from where water is in higher concentration to where water is in less concentration. Right? So either way, solutes suck, or water is going to move from where water is in higher to where water is in lower concentration. Grab onto one or both of those ways of thinking, and you'll never get it wrong. Never, never get it wrong. Now, taking a look at this cell, a cell that is put into a hypertonic environment, you can see around this cell that has kind of got these spiky notches. So this is the crenation that I'm talking about, little star-like extensions. Now finally, we're back to the same cell again. Uh, this cell, same old 10% solute. It has, however, now been put into an environment that also is 10% solute. So what's this cell going to do? What's going to happen here? Nothing, right? Nothing's going to happen. The cell's going to look back at you and smile. This is what the cell wants to be in, right? It's going to be in a very happy environment here. There's still movement of water and molecules in and out, just like in that equilibrium with the molecules. But there's no drastic influx or efflux of water. So the cell will not crenate. The cell will not swell. And you'll just have a regular looking cell this is considered isotonic. Iso meaning same. This is why you get an IV, not with pure water, but with saline. Saline is isotonic to your blood environment. If another type of ID, IV is 5% is, um, glucose or dextrose, again, that 5% sugar in the IV is essentially isotonic, and you're not creating a huge difference for the cells to deal with when you infuse that IV. OK, it is that time. And while you are doing your 40 minute, I'm going to set up a demonstration of tonicity. OK, I told you I was going to show you what a normal red blood cell looks like. Uh, this is it up on the screen. If you could see this from the side, this red blood cell would be said to be biconcave. It would have a shape a lot like this, and there would be an indentation, a concave edge on both sides. Okay? So you're looking down on the red blood cell. It doesn't ha it's like a raft, right? and the center is not missing. From the side, it would have this biconcave shape. Okay? Biconcave. All one word. Let's look back now with this vision of a normal red blood cell. And if I take a look back, now I can appreciate that that first cell I showed you has definitely taken on some fluid, right? Hypotonic, violet in, in, the, in the Willy Wonka, right? She's taken on some fluid, little blueberry girl. Then there's the crenation, hypertonic, right? You can definitely see the difference there. 
visually, and then finally here's your normal looking red blood cell with the biconcave indentation. Again, it would look the same from the top as it does from the bottom. Now I want to demonstrate this for you, and you can turn over to pages 75 and 76 in your Amerman book, and let me describe to you what the author of the book would have had you do and how I'm changing it a little bit. Now, Aaron Amerman, the author of the book, would have wanted you to do this under the microscope. Basically, you would have taken some blood, put it onto a microscope slide, added to the blood some different solutions, hypo and hypertonic solutions, and watched this change occur to the cells. Man, it happens so fast. Number one, you, if you blinked, you wouldn't see it. Number two, we're really not that familiar with the microscope yet, I don't think, to comfortably see red blood cells. They're very small. So I don't think we're quite ready for this to do it the way that she's described. So I'm going to do it this way. I have taken four drops of sheep's blood and put it into these different, micro, uh, in these different test tubes. And I'm just going to add different solutions. So to the first one, I'm just going to add some pure water. And this is just blood, about four drops of blood and some pure water. And immediately, I mean, as fast as I put it in that water, what does this look like to you? Does it look like blood? No, this looks like Kool-Aid, right? It looks like red Kool-Aid. What happened? Immediately, almost immediately upon adding the pure water, what happened to the cells? It did more than thin the blood. It, it, what happened to the cells? What happened to the cells? This is pure water. Hypotonic. What happened? The cells exploded. They lice, they burst, right? So almost instantaneously, every one of these cells took on so much water that they burst. So in that circle, right, rather than imagining what you're seeing under the microscope, you can just jot yourself a note on page 75 that when red blood cells are put into a pure water environment, into a hypotonic environment, that almost immediately the cells burst or lysed. You'd be very frustrated looking at that under the microscope because you wouldn't see anything. The second demonstration, I'm now going to take the same four drops of blood and I'm going to add to it basically contact lens solution. This is saline. So some contact lens solution in, shake. That doesn't look like Kool-Aid anymore. Right, it doesn't look as clear, does it? This is just simply diluted blood. Now, when I, if I looked at these cells under the microscope, how would they appear? And that's not cool anymore, right? That's definitely got some turbidity to it. There's some cells in there. So if I could see these cells, what would they appear as? This is saline. This would be isotonic. So these cells would be happy, right? Normal shape. They'd be biconcave. They would not have prenated. They would not have lysed. They would still be normal looking red blood cells. The third circle is over on page 76. Take those drops of blood. Now to it, I'm going to add some salty water. This is not saline, but instead something significantly more salty. Shake, shake, shake. Now, it doesn't look any different to the naked eye, right? To you and me right now, it doesn't look any different. But if I could look at these cells now, take a little bit of this blood, and look at it under the microscope, how would these cells appear? Shriveled, right? Crenated is the word I want you thinking about. So these cells would have crenated. They would have that spiky, star-like appearance to them. Can't tell the difference in the test tube, but I would be able to under the microscope. Now, where have you already in your everyday life probably either experienced or heard about this concept of tonicity or solute suck? Do you have any idea or examples? You ever been to the, into a lake and come out and you have a leech attached to your leg? Been anywhere where, where it's happened? No, maybe? Okay. Or do you have any slugs? Anybody have any slugs in their back patio sometimes? Right, those slimy little critters? How do you get rid of them? 
Put salt on them. Put salt on them. Okay. How do you get rid of that leech hanging off? You don't pull it. You'll hurt yourself more. Just pour some salt on him or her, and what happens? They shrivel up, right? Why? They have a very, they have a very you know, uh, weak exoskeleton, and the salt draws the water out of the little beast, and they shrivel up. Okay, so you, we've got this mind, right? It's kind of a gross picture, but we got this idea kind of shriveling away. You want to kill your plants? Pour salt water on them. What's going to happen? Water will get sucked out of the plants, and the cells will go wilt, and if you put enough salt water on them, they'll die. Have you ever heard of someone over-fertilizing their yard? Mm -hmm. Killed or burned their yard, burned their grass. What happened? They put so many nitrates and phosphates, some put so many molecules of fertilizer on their grass that the solutes, the fertilizer, sucked the water out of the grass, right, and caused the grass to die or to be burned. So maybe you've heard of these scenarios, but you never thought about it in this idea of tonicity or that solute suck. Okay, but we have some of these, these uh, ideas in our head or things that we've heard about. Okay, so that's tonicity. That's tonicity. Let me just do about a couple minutes on this next slide, and that is pH. So we're switching gears again. Again, this is the hodgepodge lab. We've got a lot of different concepts to cover. We've got osmosis and diffusion and filtration. We've got, um, we've got today tonicity, and then we're going to be switching over to pH and solubility. Finally, we're going to end our day with mitosis and the cell cycle. So we have quite a few different ideas to cover today. Now, the pH scale, you have got a test on this. Mr. Matoni has mentioned this. So tell me what you know or remember about the pH scale. It goes from what to what? Zero. It goes from 0 to 14. I heard that. That's good. So it goes from 0 to 14. Uh, things that are less than 7 are said to be acidic. Things that are greater than 7 are said to be alkaline or basic. Um, what is it that makes something more acidic? H plus. H plus, right? So I know if you've taken chemistry, you know there may be different ways of defining an acid. But for this class and for what we're using this semester, you can just remember that something that gives off more H plus is more acidic. And you see this increasing size of the arrow. So the more hydrogen there is, the lower the pH, the more acidic something is. Things around your house that are acidic, Coca-Cola, lemon juice, vinegar, sauerkraut, most of the food things that you eat are acidic. Right? Most food that you eat are acidic. Um, now, pH 7 is considered neutral. Let's take a look at blood for a second. That's an important one to know. Blood has a pH of 7.4. It is one of those things that your body desperately and with a lot of concern keeps balanced by homeostasis. So 7.4, that means that your blood is slightly what? Basic. Slightly basic, slightly alkaline. And it can't shift more than about half a pH value. So it can go up to about uh, 7.9. It can go down to about 6.9. If it goes beyond that, we call that death, okay? So you really can't have your pH varying very much. There are buffers in your blood that keep the pH from changing. Those buffers in your blood are the same buffers you would throw into a hot tub or a pool. If you've ever seen someone setting up a pool, they're throwing in big bags of Arm & Hammer baking soda basically into the pool as a buffer and your blood has that same sort of buffering power where it resists changes in pH, keeps it right at about 7.4. And as we go through the course, and especially when we get to Biology 106, we'll talk about how the kidneys are really, really important in buffering and keeping your blood pH the same, and your respiratory system is also helping with that quite a bit. Now, moving above 7, now we get into things that are basic, and this would be milk and magnesia. Why would someone pull that stuff out and take a swig? They've got a heartburn, right? They've got a very acidic stomach. They've got an upset stomach. And they would take some milk and magnesia to do what? What's the word I'm looking for? Bring the pH closer to neutral. So we would say we would take milk and magnesia in order to what? Neutralize, right, the stomach. And then other things that are quite basic in your house might be uh, ammonia or even oven cleaner. 
Have you ever felt oven cleaner? It always says wear gloves, right, when you spray that stuff in there. And if you ever felt it, it's extremely slippery. It feels really cool. I mean, it's really, really slippery. But suddenly you look at your fingers and they're kind of getting raw, right? It will definitely damage your skin if you bathe in that stuff for very long. So you don't want to be touching strong, strong bases. You also don't want to be touching strong, strong acids because what does an acid feel like? Anyone ever had a strong acid? It burns. It prints. It feels prickly and then it burns. So you won't be as happy with the feeling of a strong acid, which is very much why we're gonna wear gloves because as we look at these acids in a few minutes, I'll tell you we will be playing with a couple of acids that would burn you if you, if you went swimming in it. So we wanna make sure we're protected against that. Last thing before we do our last measurement is each number on this scale represents a 10-fold difference in the concentration of hydrogen. And we say this is a logarithmic scale. Right, so logarithmic scale. So three, which is a stronger acid, three or five? Three. three is a stronger acid. What's the stronger acid, 10 or 12? Ten. 10, right? The lower the number, the stronger the acid. What's the stronger base, 10 or 12? 12. 12. Three to four, tenfold difference in hydrogen. Three to five, hundredfold difference, right? Not 20, but 10 times 10. Good. Um, take a quick break. Take your measurement. Is this the last one? 50 minutes. Okay, so take your 50-minute measurement, and then I'll take a couple minutes and tell you what we're going to do next, as well as what you're going to use this data, how you're going to use this data. Did your results appear as you expected? In the end, did three move further than two? Your state is kind of the same. Anybody else have a little bit? Did three go just a little bit more than two? A little bit. Now, if you didn't get ideal results, tell me what is probably the biggest culprit. What, why would you have not gotten the ideal expected results? Because my blob was yeah. obnoxiously shaped. Because? I put something else in. Okay. So, okay, let's keep going. Why, what was not well controlled in this little demonstration? Mm -hmm. Volume, right? The amount that you put into the wells. And some of you may have squeezed a little hard. Some of you may have missed a little well. There's all sorts of reasons to have misshaped, paisley-shaped uh, little blobs, right? So that's certainly not going to help in figuring this whole thing out. Remember that volume is not one of the factors that affect diffusion, right? Volume is not one of the factors, so don't think about that as a, quote, thing that's going to change the rate of diffusion. Now, what are you going to do with this data? One of the basic things we want to make sure that all of our science students can do is make a graph. So, follow along here. I'm going to send us over to, uh, you're going into your Blackboard site, and if you'll go just under, uh, you're in Mr. Matoni's lecture section, and you go under lab materials, and go down to lab two, and here you will see a uh, link that says lab two graph. Click on that, and that's going to bring you to a site called Kids Zone. Don't be insulted by that, but it's just a really easy place to go to make graphs. And let's agree. Uh, what kind of graph would be the best type of graph to show the movement, the distance that these dyes have diffused over time? Line, line graph. Yay. So let's, I don't want to see any bar graphs next week, right? Only line graphs. Click on line graph, and then you can put your data in, put your title in of your graph. What would be the x-axis, the horizontal axis? Time, right? 0, 10, 20, 30, 50 minutes. And then what would be the y-axis? Centimeters or millimeters diffused, right? Now, it could have been the diameter or the radius, whichever you chose to measure. And then you'll put your data points in here. Now, how many total data points will you have? There were four dies, and each die you measured six times, right? Don't forget about the zero minutes. So you'll have 24 total data points that you will put into this in making your graph. Then you can click on the, the tab over here, labels, you can change the fonts and change the colors. You certainly don't have to do any of that. Once you've got your numbers in there, hit preview tab and it will show you your graph. If it looks right, then go down to print and you can print it out and you will include this with your pre-lab next week. So when you're doing pre-lab number three, this is worth two of your five points is having your graph properly made and properly labeled.
There's a little uh, rubric, grading rubric, on your pre-lab number three to make sure you don't forget anything in making your graph. If you get to your graph and it doesn't look quite right, just back up and change your data, change your labels, whatever it is that you want to change. Do not send it to me. I don't want to receive this by email, but you can email it to yourself if you're not at a place where you have a printer and then print it out later when you're at the campus uh, to print it out. Again, it doesn't have to be color, just black and white is fine. Even though you're doing this in groups, I want to see that each person makes their own graph. Okay, so each person should be responsible for making their own graph. And don't forget too that in each of these files, you will now find the answers also to all of the check your understanding and check your recall section. So you'll find those answers also here for these uh, lab presentations. In a moment, or actually not in a moment, it, at the end of the day, we're going to be looking at this field of view worksheet. And I want you to see that the field of view worksheet answers are right here also under lab two. Okay, so when, later on when I mention that, you'll know that it's here under lab two. Okay, any questions about diffusion? osmosis, tonicity, and does everyone understand why you have the results in your diffusion plate that you do? Number three for the quiz next week, make sure you can interpret the diffusion data. Do you really understand why certain dyes move further than others based upon their molecular weight, based upon their concentration? It could have been about temperature, although we did not demonstrate that here today. The, the solubility was or sorry, the permeability of the membrane was the same. We we're all dealing with the same auger, and we were all dealing with the same um, um, surface area. That didn't change either. Okay, so we are now going to move on, and we're already talking about pH here a little bit. If I turn this pH scale, just turn it 90 degrees and just see it in a different way. Again, just keep in mind that things that are down here at zero are very, very acidic and things moving toward the higher numbers are increasingly basic, or re think about it another way, increasingly basic or, or decreasingly acidic, right? So it's a big old scale from 0 to 14. We're going to switch over now and talk about pH a little bit. You're going to turn over to your uh, lab manual to pages 38 and 39. 38 and 39. I apologize, there's not really much time for a break here today. We're just going to keep on going. But on pages 38 and 39, you're going to first come across some notes of paper. Those are uh, pieces of pH paper. And uh, we've already cut some little pieces of pH paper for you throughout the lab. You'll find them in little beakers at your table. You'll find some forceps as well. You can certainly touch this paper, it's not going to hurt you. But keep in mind, your skin does have acids, and so it can influence the value. So we're asking that you just use the forceps with the pH paper. You should also find on your tray two keys, or maybe three, for the pH paper. And you'll see that this pH paper that we're providing for you is a very broad range. It can measure zero, pH zero, bright red, all the way up to dark bluish pH 13. So it's a very broad pH paper you wouldn't be able to differentiate between 6.2 and 6.8 using this paper, but it does give you a good broad indication if something's acidic or basic, and it gives you an, an indication of that. So on page 38, you're going to see uh, where you are going to determine the pH of six different substances. You'll find them scattered throughout the room on each side. And it just says acid one, acid two, base one, base two, unknown one, unknown two. The description will talk about test tubes. Rather than test tubes, we've given each of your tables some glass wells. If you're missing them, check up by the sink. The previous group may have washed them off and left them up there. But you should find two or three of these glass wells. These are certainly not disposable. Do not throw these away. These are very expensive. But you're going to use this rather than a test tube. So basically, you will take the forceps, take a piece of, uh, filter, of uh, pH paper, drip one drop of the acid on the paper over this well to catch the excess, and then look at the key and record the pH. It's very straightforward. But we want to make sure that you are familiar with this idea of pH. And if you're struggling with that at all, the hope is that by the time you finish this lab, 
you'll really be rock solid understanding pH and what we're doing here. The next page, you're going to be comparing rolates, Alka-Seltzer, and Tums. And again, on each side of the room, in different blue trays, you're going to find some pulverized antacids. There's a little scoop in there. And then there's also a vial. And the vial says 0.1 molar HCl. That represents the stomach acid in the description of the protocol. Follow through the protocol. Again, rather than test tubes, you're going to be using one of the glass plates, the little wells. Finally, you're going to turn over to page 43 and 44. What you're skipping over, you're not responsible for. And there you're going to look at solubility. Again, we have a, a tray on each side of the room. There's water. Water is a polar solvent. We know that water is polar. There's also there acetone. Now, acetone is a, is a good example of a non polar solvent. Your book calls for paint thinner. So we're substituting acetone for the paint thinner. And what you're going to do, again, with your glass plates, you're going to take a, just a few crystals of the salts and the different substances, and you're going to determine if they dissolve or are soluble in water, or if instead they are soluble in acetone. The phrase is, like dissolves like. So something that is polar will dissolve in water. Something that is nonpolar, like a lipid or a nonpolar molecule, will not dissolve in water. Conversely, nonpolar molecules will dissolve in acetone. You've all experienced this. Um, if you are using watercolors, right, you're painting something, and it's a water-based paint, and you get it on you, what do you do to wash your hands? Go to the sink, right? And your water, those water-based paints will wash off your skin. But if you're painting a latex-based outdoor exterior paint, and you get it on your hands or oil paints, and you get it, what do you have to do? You put your hand in the water and nothing happens. You have to instead get some turpentine, some paint thinner, some acetone, something like that that will take that off your skin. Ladies, you also know about this with, with fingernail polish. Right? Fingernail polish comes off with acetone. Right? This is the same stuff. You know, you're paying really a lot of money for acetone when you get fingernail polish remover. So you know that your fingernail polish must be what? Polar or nonpolar? It must be nonpolar, right? Because you can put it on, and you can put your finger under water. It doesn't come off. But you have to wait and take it off with acetone, which is nonpolar. Like dissolves like, so the fingernail polish must also be nonpolar. So each group is going to do these three activities, pH, antacids, and solubility. You may not yourself do each of these things, but after about 15 or 20 minutes, you guys will converse and chat amongst yourselves at each table about what you did, compare answers, and then as a class, we'll debrief, and I'll make sure that you understand the key ideas from this. Again, we're definitely playing with some acids and bases here, and the acetone, so please goggles, gloves for everybody, and... Uh, your protective cover, cover, and I'll go over this thing. Ask me if you have any questions at all. So, what did you discover when you were just doing the pH paper? What was the pH of acid number one? Page 38, acid number one? pH? I got a three. About a three, right? That's, that's fairly acidic, right? You wouldn't want to go swimming in that for sure. Acid number two? Four. Okay, so clearly both acids less than seven. Base number one. Thirteen. Thirteen. Whoa. That's, I mean, that's very alkaline. That's up there with oven cleaner. That's not going to feel good. Uh, and four, and uh, base two? Eight. Eight or nine. Now, if you're plus or minus one, it's okay. This paper can be a little bit off. Uh, then how about unknown one? Three. Two or three, clearly an acid. Unknown two? Thirteen, clearly a base. No problems understanding acid versus base based upon the pH number. Next, which of these three antacids, Rolaids, Tums, or Alka-Seltzer, are you, based upon this experiment, likely to go purchase at Walgreens? Tums. I'm hearing Tums. Everyone's saying Tums. Interesting. I don't always have consensus. Um, why are you saying that? What did Tums do for your numbers? Brought the pH closer to neutral, right? Brought it up to six or seven. 
Now, what is wrong with this experiment? Why would you not want to base your entire buying power on this experiment? Well, your stomach's not pure, yep. Yeah. What else is kind of poorly controlled in this experiment? Yeah, the amount of the antacid, right? Those scoops are a little bit different. You didn't add exactly the same amount. If you know about plop, plop, fizz, fizz, Alka-Seltzer, they're big tablets. Rolades and Tums are smaller. So we didn't have you add the dosage, right, a, a necessarily a, a single dose to do this experiment. So in that regard, it's not the best experiment, is it? It would take a lot of Alka-Seltzer tablet, right, to make up for, the, for, for our Rolades. So keep that in mind. But as long as you understand that uh, the antacid uh, preference is the one that brought the pH up closer to neutral, then I'm OK with your understanding of that concept. Now let's move on to solubility. We had water, which is a polar solvent, and acetone, which is our nonpolar solvent. And you were asked to dissolve different substances into those solvents. One of them was salt. The salt is very basically NaCl. OK, so the salt was NaCl. And what did we discover? Salt. Did it dissolve in water? Yeah. Yes. Did it dissolve in acetone? No. no. So salt is polar, right? Because it, like water, they, they got along really well. Now, what about the sugar? It was sucrose. Sucrose is a disaccharide, right? It's a glucose and a fructose holding hands chemically. And what did that sucrose do? This is table sugar, regular old table sugar. Yes. What did it do? Dissolved, dissolved in? water and not in acetone, so it also is polar. What about I2? This is iodine. Now what iodine is, it's an, I, it's, an, it's an iodine atom attached to another one. The electrons are being shared, it's a covalent bond, but they're being shared equally, so there is in the end no polarity, no negative or positive nature to this molecule. So, what did, you, what did you discover? Did iodine dissolve in water? No. no, it kind of floated there. What about in acetone? No. Absolutely. So, we know that iodine is nonpolar. Now, that's really the take home lesson. Um, the other unknowns, one of them had a funky smell. I think it's unknown C. You may recognize that odor. That was mothballs, right? So, C was mothballs, the white, kind of chunky stuff. And that did dissolve in the acetone, didn't it? Not in the water. Well, it didn't ask for, but there were three unknowns over there. One, two, A, B, and C. And then uh, I forget one of them. I think unknown B was another sugar, maltose. That should have been okay in the water, polar. And the other unknown A, what happened to it? it dissolved in water as well, didn't it? Okay. So, so do you understand? So if I said to you, if I take a substance and I put it into water, and it does not dissolve then that substance is nonpolar. OK, that's the take home lesson. If you understand that, fantastic. Now, I want you to clean up. And you may have already, already done this. And this is where, honestly, the greatest opportunity is for you to get hurt. You go to the sink, turn the water on very lightly, and wash out your glass plates. When you're doing that, make sure you've got goggles and gloves on and covering. I wouldn't want that to splash back at you. Again, some of these acids and bases are rather on the extreme ends. So go ahead, and if you haven't already cleaned up, do so. And if you have, great. If you cleaned up, you can also start grabbing your microscopes. We're still not done. You can grab your microscopes, and we'll be looking at your PowerPoint notes as well. So clean up, and once you're done, you can fold your lab coats and put them back in the gray bin. Please fold them so whomever wore this last hour, can we can distribute them. So fold it, find that person's name, and fold it so it's near the top. So we can distribute them next time. Clean up, get your microscopes in anticipation of our next little activity, and we'll come back together in a couple of minutes. So the, the, the last concept we have to talk about is cell cycle, and that is uh, what is shown, or will be shown on the next slide when I go through this little demonstration. And so to, to kind of get an idea of this, I just want to draw this. This is representing that blessed moment at fertilization. Right, where egg and sperm come together. And at that moment, that fertilized egg is called the what? 
Everybody knows this, the zygote, right? And then the zygote undergoes cleavage, for obvious reasons why we call it cleavage, right? It goes, undergoes division, and it divides to become two cells, and then four and eight, and eventually you end up with a ball of cells, sort of a solid ball of cells, and we're going to call that ball of cells, don't think of it as two-dimensional, but three-dimensional sphere, and that ball of cells is a blastula. You can't see that, can you? Huh. I'm seeing these wandering eyes, and I'm wondering, why? What are you looking at? Okay. So you got the zygote, and then it undergoes cleavage, and then eventually we end up with a bunch of cells, right, in a, what's called a blastula. And it's from that blastula that every cell in your body is going to be formed. So this is the earliest stages of the embryo. And this would be the very beginning of your life cycle, right? We all have a life cycle. But we also would say that every cell in your body, all of the trillions of cells in your body, also are in their cell cycle, in their own life cycle. And this idea of a life cycle is shown on this next slide. So in this, the cell cycle, four parts to it, and it starts with the G1 phase. Uh, the G1, some books call it gap, some books call it the growth phase. But either way, this is when the cell is, you know, it's growing, it's, it's uh, taking in nutrients, it's doing its metabolism, it's responding to its environment, it's doing all the things that cells do. And then if all of the chemical signals are right, then the cell will go into S phase. Now, S is for synthesis, and this is the time when the DNA will be replicated. If you make a replica of something, you make an exact copy. So it's during this time that the DNA is copied and replication occurs, and also other organelles are duplicated and made more of. Then the cell comes out of that S phase and goes into a second G phase called G2, very easy to remember. The second growth phase, and this is when the cell again is growing and, and doing all the things that cells do. And then at some point, if all the signals are correct, the cell will divide. And it will go into what's referred to as mitosis, or the M phase. Now from the video, you know that mitosis is even further divided up into four stages. And we're going to be looking at cells undergoing those four stages today. So this is the cell cycle, the four parts of the cell cycle. Once the cell goes through mitosis, and once the cell divides, then that, those two daughter cells now find themselves in G1, right? So we just continue around and around. Now, the cell cycle can be completed in you and me in as quickly as eight hours. Some of your cells can go through their entire cell cycle and divide in eight hours. Others in your body never divide. Others take weeks, years, even years or months and years to divide. So um, your skin, right? If you cut your skin, you know it's going to heal rather quickly, and very soon it'll all be taken care of. If you burn your tongue, you know that the cells in your tongue are going to quickly repair themselves. The reason that heart attacks are so devastating is that once a part of the cardiac muscle is damaged, it doesn't regenerate. Once neurons of the spinal cord or the brain are damaged, they don't regenerate. They don't sit there and go through their cell cycle and replace themselves. So once the brain or the spinal cord or the heart are damaged, that's it, right? We don't have a way of, of making more. Skin is quite different. So cells have different characteristics and time scales, if you will, when it comes to the cell cycle. Now, what the, knowing what the cell cycle is important, I also want you to be able to recognize what's going on in the four stages of mitosis. In a moment, after I go through this, you're going to grab a slide. You're going to be looking at this blastula of cells, this ball of cells, you're going to be looking for cells actively in the stages of mitosis, and I'll help you with that in a moment. Now, in prophase, I think of P uh, for prepare. This is the phase of mitosis at the very beginning, and we're, we're preparing to divide. Now, what has to happen? Three important things. Number one, the nucleus is going to disappear. Okay, it's going to disintegrate, disappear, dis uh, whatever word you want to use, dissociate, but the nucleus is going to break down. Number two, the mitotic spindles, you see them here, the mitotic spindles are going to form. 
Okay, so the mitotic spindles are going to form. In a moment, they're going to reach out and grab the pairs of chromosomes and start pulling them apart. And thirdly, the chromosomes, which here appear as little red and blue Xs, those chromosomes are going to be, become so tightly packed that we'll actually be able to see them under the microscope. So the chromosomes become visible. Okay, we normally would not be able to see chromosomes under the microscope, but during mitosis, the chromosomes become visible. So that's what's going on during prophase. Nucleus going away, mitotic spindles are being formed, and the uh, chromosomes appear. Number two phase, metaphase. This is the easiest one to recognize. Uh, the chromosomes characteristically line up along the equator of the cell. So a cell has a polarity. A cell knows it's north from its south. A cell has an equator, if you will, and all of the chromosomes will line up along that equatorial plate. That is very characteristic of metaphase. I just think M for middle. Then anaphase, A for apart. It's here that the cell will begin to not become two cells quite yet. It's, it's going to start stretching. And I always imagined here that it looks more like a rugby ball. Okay, it's kind of elongating, becoming more like a rugby ball. And uh, the chromosomes, you can see, are being pulled apart. Now, keep in mind, those chromosomes went into mitosis already duplicated. Remember, they were copied back in S phase. So when you go into mitosis, all of the chromosomes have already been duplicated. You've already got two of everything. So all you're basically doing during mitosis is just splitting down the middle. So you're taking one copy of each and pulling them to their respective cells. And then, finally, telophase, T for two. We're now forming the, the two daughter cells. Telo also means end or last. So if you know that, meaning end or last phase, or T for two. And now you really begin to see the cleavage forming as the two cells begin to divide. They're still somewhat attached. What happens during telophase is the reverse of what happened in prophase. So the nucleus in telophase is going to what? See the nucleus? It's reforming, isn't it? So the nucleus comes back. The mitotic spindles, they've already done their job of pulling the chromosomes. We don't need them anymore. So the mitotic spindles are going to dissociate or break down or go away. And finally, the chromosomes are going to start to unravel and not be quite so tightly packed and they will once again become invisible to you under the light microscope. So just reverse prophase and telophase activities. And then finally, when the cells, the, the one cell, splits into its two identical daughter cells, we call that blessed moment cytokinesis. Cyto, cell, kinesis, kinetic, kinesiology, movement. Right? So when the cells are able to move one from another, that is the moment of cytokinesis. And at the moment of cytokinesis, now, right, each of the two daughter cells finds itself beginning the cell cycle once again at G1. So then we go around again. So every cell is somewhere in its life cycle, somewhere in its cell cycle. So what you're going to do right now, hopefully when you took your microscope out, the people who did it before put it away properly, kind of go through that mental checklist. The stage was lowered. The forex objective was in place. Uh, the light intensity is down. When you plug it in, nothing happens because the power was turned off. I hope they did that properly. If you find one that was greatly abused, please let me know. Uh, we definitely want to keep track of those individuals who are not caring for our microscopes properly. And now you're going to grab up here. Come on up and grab one of these slides. Uh, these are blastula so slides. These are cells taken from an early fish embryo. And basically, in this ball of cells, you're now going to be able to see cells that are undergoing mitosis. So in this ball of cells, watch up here really quick. Some of these cells will find all the chromosomes lined up in a row. So that would be a good example of? You got an M, metaphase. And some of these... They're going to be looking a little more football-like, and you're going to see them kind of lined up and separating. That would be a good example of anaphase. anaphase. Telophase is going to have cleavage. So if you clearly see the, the, the indentation and you see the chromosomes being pulled apart, that would be a good telophase. Can I put my microscope out that fell on the ground? Fell on the ground? Yeah. OK, 
Okay, beautiful. I'll take care of that in a second. And then if you see instead just the chromosomes all jumbled up in a circle, we're going to call that prophase. So the picture I have for you here is your, la your last slide here. And at the top, that's prophase. You see all the chromosomes in a ball. And then it's metaphase. You see them lined up. Anaphase are being pulled apart. And telophase, you can see them clearly separated. Your real job here is to make sure you can recognize these stages. You will have to go up to 10x and perhaps even to 40x objective to see this. So make sure you start at 4x. Make sure you start at 4x, that you find the whole ball of cells. On the slide, there'll be a little tiny pinpoint. That's the entire ball of cells. And then you'll zoom in to 10x. You'll see those cells. And then if you zoom in even higher, you'll be able to see the chromosomes within the cell. If you're not seeing anything at all, let me know. So the last thing I want to show you is uh, the field of view worksheet. This worksheet is actually uh, in uh, Lab 3 material. So go ahead and grab that worksheet out. And let me show you, just to introduce this to you, and I want you to write what I put here on, the, on this right now. And what I'm going to show you on the bottom of that first page, you're going to see three circles. And these three circles represent the field of view, the big circle of light that you see when you look into the microscope. That's called the field of view, or the FOV. And the circle on the left represents what you're seeing with the 4x objective, in the middle, the 10x objective, and on the right, the 40x objective. Keep in mind that when you're using those objectives, that's a total magnification of 40, 100, and 400. So what you would do is, is take a plastic ruler, and you can do that right now, and tell me how many millimeters, if you focus down on the metric side of that plastic ruler, take the slide out and instead focus in on this ruler, how many millimeters are you able to physically see from edge to edge of that field of view? And you're going to see just under five. We're going to call ahead and call it five millimeters for the purpose of easy numbers. So from edge to edge, that represents five meters, or five millimeters, sorry. Now go ahead and, and switch over to the 10x objective and tell me now how many millimeters can you see, and you should now see two millimeters. And then if you flip over to the 40x objective, you should now only be able to see, you may not see anything at all, but I'll tell you right now, it's half a millimeter, 0.5. Now there's a mathematical relationship here that I want you to think about. As you zoom in from the 4x to the 10x objective, you are going to see things multiplied or amplified by a factor of 2.5. Therefore, just like on Google Earth, what you will see will be reduced or divided by 2.5. So 5 divided by 2.5 is in fact 2. Likewise, when you go from 10x to 40x, you're going to see things four times larger. So the area would be reduced by a factor of 4, divided by 4, and 2 divided by 4 is 1 half. So write this down on that first page. Uh, the second page you can ignore. We won't be doing the activities on page two, but page three and four of this two-page handout give you um, some problems. So please go ahead and look through those problems, try those problems, and then you'll find the answers posted for you on Blackboard under lab two. And next week, we'll entertain questions about the field of view calibrations and worksheet, uh, worksheet questions. And then you won't be quizzed on it in quiz three, but instead you will be quizzed on field of view on quiz four. That concludes all the activities for lab number two. There are a lot of different activities, but keep in mind uh, you just need to be familiar with all of these different concepts for next week's quiz and certainly for the lab practical in about four weeks.